Hi everyone. So today I bring to you a new video on editorial analysis. And um, I'm going to analyze an article from the Hindu, which is about the downward revision of India's growth projection by the World Bank. So this article recently featured uh, in the Hindu newspaper, and uh, it is titled The Growth Pangs on World Bank Forecast for India. So we all know students that, uh, you know, uh, last year and early this year around the budget time, there were some very rosy uh, projections made for India's growth. However, the World Bank has downward revised India's growth projections. And World Bank is not the only uh, agency that has done that. The other agencies like, um, you know, uh, like IMF and uh, RBI itself and Moody's, they've also uh, downward revised India's growth projection students. So if you see the point one written here, it says that the World Bank paired its 2022 growth projection for South Asian economies to 6.6% from an estimate of 7.6%. Now this tells us students that uh, this, uh, you know, reduction of the growth rate, projected growth rate is not something to, something unique to India alone, but this has been done for most of the South Asian economies. In fact, this has been done for the entire world students. Most of the countries around the world are growing at a uh, much lesser rate than expected. If you look at point number four, it says that India's GDP, the bank reckons, may now grow by 8% in 2022 23, not 8.7% as it had earlier forecasted. So the earlier forecast students, in its uh, earlier uh, projection, the World Bank had said that India would grow at 8.7%, but now it has changed that to 8%. And why? So now we ne uh, need to get to the root of it as to why these reductions have been made. Students. So the primary reason for this is students that even as we were, you know, trying to or struggling to recover from the negative impact of the pandemic, we were hit by the Russia-Ukraine conflict students, and that has triggered fresh challenges. So we were still at the you know, at the cusp of recovery, we had not fully recovered as a country or as a world, we were still recovering when we were, you know, uh, we, we are faced with this new challenge of Russia-Ukraine conflict and this triggered fresh challenges. And what did this do students? What impact did Russia-Ukraine conflict had on the world? So basically it led to high oil prices, high commodity prices, food prices, and this exacerbated the you know, inflation in most countries. So inflation was already hovering around very high levels. So it was worsened by this conflict, right? Now, moving on students to next point, the article also notes, however, there are some positive surprises in recent data such as strong digital services exports. So that's the silver lining there that India is doing very well. There's a rebound in the digital services export students. However, the worrisome point is there is high inflation and there's incomplete labor market revival. So labor market revival is incomplete. It was reviving when it was obstructed by this uh, conflict. And it says that India's recovery varies widely across sectors and manufacturing. Right. So we've spoken about this, uh, I think, in one of the previous videos that India is expected to see a K-shaped recovery, that different sectors are growing at different rates. So we don't have, a, have one uniform growth rate for all the sectors, but certain sectors are growing at a much faster rate than others. Some sectors are very sluggish, the sectors that were um, that had a severe impact of the pandemic students, like your, say, your tourism and hospitality and you know, all these sectors. Right. So it says that this is coupled with weak demand and increased input cost. So increased oil prices, increased commodity prices. So that has led to increase in input cost, further worsening the situation. Now, students, the article also notes that the World Bank's projections about India's growth, they are more sanguine than others. That means World Bank's projections for India are 
uh, more optimistic than other uh, agencies. That means the other agencies like the Asian Development Bank and the IMF and the World Economic Outlook, they have, you know, uh, the figures that they have or they anticipate for India, they are worse than the World Bank's projections. So World Bank's projections are more sanguine, more optimistic than other agencies. And as you can see, the Asian Development Bank expects India to grow by 7.2% and IMF by 8% students. And what World Economic Outlook has said that the two countries with the most notable downgrades, which, has, which have seen maximum downward reduction are India and Japan students, right? And what does it reflect? It reflects in part weaker domestic demand as higher oil prices are expected to weigh on private consumption and investments. Obviously, higher oil prices, is, it, that, that's not something that happens independently. I mean, it, it, uh, it doesn't happen in a silos. It has negative repercussions for, uh, for other aspects, for example, private consumption and investment. And all of these together uh, would also drag lower net exports and would further um, slower the economic growth. Now, students, what are the concerns specifically here? So number one, global supply chain disruptions. So this is something that happened during the pandemic also, that obviously because of the high oil prices, particularly the industrial activity would be impacted and global supply chain would be disrupted students. So there are going to be supply constraints. Then students, inflation will need to be addressed, right? So inflation is one of the uh, most crucial pain points at the moment. It's one of the biggest challenges that we need to face as a country and as a world. Then students, the article says that, uh, uh, so this is not just based on this article, but um, I have you know, taken or drawn po uh, points from other articles as well. So what they say is that there is a need to rethink growth engines as well. The pursuit of free trade agreements indicates a fresh stance that if India uh, needs to deal with this challenge, if India needs to push its economic growth, it will have to boost its trade students and therefore getting into free trade agreements, a case in point is that of RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership students. So India will need to revisit it. India can consider joining this. So we all know students that RCEP is a China-led um, you know, trade agreement and it's one of the largest economic trade groups envisioned. However, India chose to stay out of it because um, of certain concerns that it, uh, there were no clear assurances on market access to countries like uh, China. So India chose to stay out of it, even though it's one of the uh, biggest free trade agreements ever with the, all the Asian countries and some of the Pacific countries like New Zealand and Australia and Japan uh, and South Korea being uh, part of it. But India has clearly steered away from it. Then students, the farm sector will be negatively impacted due to the rising cost. That's another challenge. So because of high inflation students, the, one of the sectors that would be worst impacted is the farm sector. Even though there are some positive uh, projections for the, mon uh, for the monsoons, yet this is one challenge that remains. Unemployment is high students, which is another matter of concern. Oil price is a concern, right? So these are the set of challenges that India faces. And the next few months will be critical for India's economy as the government and the RBI work at balancing the stress on inflation, currency, external account, and fiscal deficit. So, you know, the government and the RBI will have to do this very balancing act to ensure that it can control inflation, it can control the currency, fluctuations of the currency, it can, uh, uh, it has to ensure that the external account does well, and fiscal deficit needs to be reined in, right? So these are all the challenges that we face as a country. Now, coming to the positive students. Now, you know, the RBI chief said that even though there has been a downward revision by various agencies, including the RBI itself, it does not come in the way of any investment plan by the private sector. That means it's not going to 
uh, have a very major impact on investments, right? So the downward, in spite of the downward revision. It said that India's underlying economic fundamentals are strong, and despite the short-term turbulence, the impact on the long-term outlook will be marginal. So basically, the impact of the pandemic, or for that matter, the impact of the Russia-Ukraine war, these are seen as viewed as short-term turbulences. However, the impact on the long-term outlook is going to be marginal, not significant, and India's underlying economic fundamentals are strong. Then it says that while the downward revision is a bit of a dampener, overall sentiment about growth is positive. That means India needs, need not worry. The overall business sentiment within the country, consumption sentiment, investment sentiment, that is positive students. And even at this rate, the, even after the downward revision students, India will be the fastest growing large economy. And India has the capability to weather the storm. The exports are strong. Our foreign exchange reserves are good. Our inflation on an average is within the 6% range, students. Right. So that's the target that has been set by uh, RBI. We have slightly breached the target in the recent past, very slightly. But that is just, you know, those fluctuations are like a natural uh, part of the whole business. So that's okay. Our capacity utilization is very high. Our private sector investment seems to be coming back. So these are the positives. You should keep this in mind, students, that our exports are strong. We have good foreign exchange reserves. Our inflation is well within control. Our capacity utilization is high and private sector investment also seems to be coming back. And to add to this, the good news is India has endured the pandemic for over two years and has come out of it more resilient students. So if you, if you compare India's performance with a week, other countries in terms of dealing with the pandemic or for that matter, the impact of the pandemic. Uh, India has been resilient. Yes, there have been issues in the past. Uh, we understand that our uh, health system needs a major overhaul and we could have been better prepared. But India has been resilient in dealing with the pandemic students. We have endured it. Now, coming to the impact of the Russia-Ukraine war on India, so that's not going to be very significant other than the general average rise in prices, oil prices and all, which is like a worldwide phenomena. India would not be severely impacted because even though Russia and India's relationship was quite good, but our exports and imports were not very much. So India doesn't trade much with either Russia or Ukraine, particularly um, why we talk about Russia because uh, India has very positive relations with Russia. So one might believe that you know, we would be deeply impacted by it. We would be to a certain extent, but not to a very large extent. Then students, government spending on infrastructure has been growing. And this would support demand and economic activity. So we all know all the major announcements that were made as part of the budget that uh, uh, the government would be spending on the infrastructure. So that is going to keep the demand and the economic activity going students. Consumption as a result will start picking up. So people are quite positive about the growth in the Indian economy students. So yeah, I was talking about the various growth enhancing policies and schemes students. So number of growth enhancing policies and schemes were announced in the budget, such as the production linked incentives and increased infrastructure spending students. So there would be stronger multiplier effect on jobs and income and high productivity and more efficiency all leading to accelerated economic growth. So basically it says that the infrastructure spending by the government would have a multiplier effect on the jobs and the incomes. That's going to result in higher productivity and efficiency and hence accelerated economic growth students. There, there's government's emphasis on manufacturing students. Government has been giving a lot of incentives to push manufacturing sectors such as lower taxes and uh, you know, then we have rising service exports, we have stronger digitalization, we have technologically, uh, technological transformation drives, and all this would aid the growth students. And of course, there are one more important point here is students, that India stand to benefit, please note this, please, please note this students, this is very important, that India stands to benefit from these geopolitical conflicts in the sense 
that it would enhance India's status as a preferred alternate investment destination. Right. So, for example, all the countries that were doing business in the eastern, some of the eastern countries that share their border with Russia, which are uh, located around Ukraine in, in that region, students. So they might consider shifting their operations to other, you know, to other alternative destinations and India could be one of them. So it, it, it depends on how India capitalizes on that gap. Now, coming to the health front students, on the health front, a large vaccinated population will likely help contain the impact of subsequent infect infection waves, if any. So another positive point is that a substantial uh, portion of the population has been vaccinated students, and that's going to contain the impact of subsequent infection waves, right? So the hope is that the current pressures on the economy too shall pass. So this too shall pass, right? Okay, so that's all for this video, students. I'll see you soon with yet another video. Thank you so much.